Must you be subject to trial by military commission or something like that? Right, Lynn? In our panels today, we've talked about interrogation techniques with regard to alleged terrorists. We, the second morning panel talked about how challenges to detention filed by alleged terrorists are handled. And now uh, this panel uh, seeks to close the loop. In other words, after you've interrogated, detained, then ultimately how do you prosecute these individuals? There's a, there's a raging debate that goes on in this country with regard to use of military commissions, military tribunals, as against trial in our civil courts. And that's not our purpose today to get into that debate. But I, I would suggest to you that there is a great deal of naivete and actually misinformation about military commissions. Many people consider them to be the same as courts martial uh, and, and yet do not understand. Uh, I would tell you that military commissions have a rich history. Uh, the first trial in this country was a military commission of Major Andre in Revolutionary War days, long before we had the federal courts. So military commissions have been used historically. There has always been recognized in international law the right of a military commander to capture, detain, and prosecute those of the enemy and even those of his own troops for violations of the law of war. This is not a new concept. And the issue has been throughout history, going all the way back to the Revolutionary War days, how is the due process set for these military tribunals, these military commission trials? Uh, we all know that President Bush on the 13th of November of 2001 actually established a military commission system that to be honest with you was modeled on President Roosevelt's system from World War II dealing with the German saboteurs. The, the executive order of President Roosevelt looks strikingly similar to the military order of President Bush. It was modeled in the White House not by military lawyers but by the Office of White House Counsel, then Judge Gonzalez, and Department of Justice personnel. That was the system that the Supreme Court last summer struck down in my view, not as unconstitutional, but is in violation of two specific statutes of Congress, Article 21 and Article 36 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I won't get us into the debate on whether the President of the United States has independent authority to create military commissions. Uh, there's varying views on that. I have one, others have, other, have uh, other views with regard to whether Congress must create them. Regardless, last fall, the Congress and the Military Commissions Act which as you've already heard this morning has a great deal to do with other things besides military commissions, established a military commission system that was built upon the core principles of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, but changes were made to accommodate the trial, the military trial of terrorists. And, and it is that system created by Congress last fall that we're gonna try to explain to you today and invite your questions. Uh, and and I, I couldn't think of a better panel to bring together than the very senior people who are running it or were in a position of running it. I'll introduce them very briefly right now. Our first speaker is retired General, retired Major General John Altenberg. He is now of counsel to the Greenberg Trial Week firm in Washington, D.C., but of more relevance to our panel, he served 28 years as an Army Judge Advocate where he held a number of prestigious substantive and managerial positions, notably just before retirement as the Deputy Judge Advocate General for the Department of the Army from 1997 until 2000. John has a BA in English and International Studies from Wayne State and a JD from the University of Cincinnati College of Law. And why he is sitting here and to be our first speaker is that from March of 2004 until November of last year, Major General Altenberg was the appointing authority, the senior official that made decisions on what cases went to trial by military commission. This was his system. And I could think of no one else to, better to invite down to our conference than Major General Altenberg to explain the system to it as he knows all so well. Our second speaker is gonna be Air Force Colonel Mo Davis, 
Moe is the chief prosecutor for the military commission system. So when we talk about the David Hicks trial a week or so ago, when we talk about oncoming trials for terrorists, Colonel Davis is the one whose attorneys, whose prosecutors will be representing the government. Uh, He's a native North Carolinian, holds an undergraduate degree from Appalachian State in Boone, and received his law degree right here in Durham at North Carolina Central University. He also holds a Master's of Law in Government Procurement Law from George Washington University and a Master's of Law in Military Law, concentration on Government Procurement Law, all from the Army's Judge Advocate General School. Colonel Davis entered active duty as an Air Force Judge Advocate in 1983, and since then has served as a Staff Judge Advocate at both the Wing and Numbered Air Force. Uh, I will tell you, though, that Colonel Davis also has a great wealth of trial experience, both as a defense counsel and as a trial counsel, and of course that's one of the main reasons why he was selected uh, to be the chief prosecutor. Following Colonel Davis will be Marine Colonel Dwight Sullivan, who is the chief defense counsel. So we've got the chief prosecutor and the chief defense counsel for the Department of Military Commissions with us today. Uh, Dwight holds a BA from the University of Maryland, and a, just a JD from the University of Virginia. He also holds a master's degree from the University of Maryland and a master's of law from the Army Judge Advocate General School up in Charlottesville. Colonel Sullivan's previous military duties include service as an appellate defense counsel and as an instructor at the Naval Justice School up at Newport, Rhode Island, and as a prosecutor in Okinawa. As a civilian, in a civilian capacity while he was not wearing the uniform, he has worked as an attorney advisor to the chambers of Judge Sparky Gerke of the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, uh, and also he was the managing attorney of the American Civil Liberties Union of the Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland office. Our last speaker is Dean Rick Rosen. He's the Associate Professor of Law and Associate Dean for Administration and External Affairs at Texas Tech University School of Law. He has his undergraduate degree from Ohio State University, his law degree from the University of Miami, and he, as well, holds a Master's of Law degree from the University of Virginia. After completing his law degree at the University of Miami, uh, he served as a litigator for a Miami law firm for four years before joining the United States Army as an Army Judge Advocate. So all of the gentlemen on the panel have that in common. Uh, he was the Staff Judge Advocate for Third Corps at Fort Hood, Texas, Special Counsel to the Attorney General for the Civil Division, Department of Justice in Washington, and Deputy Legal Counsel to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon. His last military pros prior to joining the faculty at Texas Tech was at Commandant at the Army's Judge Advocate General School in Charlottesville, where he commanded the ABA recognized law school at Charlottesville. That's our panel, and again, we seek to hopefully inform you to educate you on what the military, just, the, the military commission system under the Congressional Act is all about, and then invite your questions. So John, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we've agreed we're gonna take 10 to 12 minutes to set this out so that there's plenty of time for questions. That means there's no time for jokes. Uh, it also means there's probably no time for detail. Uh, and so there is time for provocation. And, uh, and intrigue. So uh, I'll, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to do that. First of all, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Presidential Military Order and, and when it was published. Uh, it's been criticized a lot. Uh, no one has criticized it more than I have personally. And, uh, but I want everybody to uh, put yourself back in the, in the mind frame that you had in uh, October and November. It doesn't make it any more ill-advised or any less incorrect in terms of how they came to it, but the fact is we all ought to remember what was driving people when they put together the presidential military order, and that is uh, we were all scared. And, and you have to maybe think hard to go back to October and November of 2001 and how you felt and what you thought might happen next, uh, what was going on in the world, whether you thought that uh, they were gonna start hitting buildings in Chicago or, or what, but the fact is uh, lawyers don't like to give away the farm is the, is the uh, the, the tort lawyer's expression or the corporate lawyer's expression and the lawyers in the federal government at the time didn't want to give away the farm. No one wanted to do something that was weaker than it needed to be uh, because everybody was concerned with protecting the country and protecting our, our security. Uh, in retrospect, perhaps some were concerned along with those 
issues with expanding executive authority and doing other things, but certainly we didn't know that then, and many of us gave them a pass based on what we thought was wrong with what they did uh, because we were concerned and we were scared also. Uh, the presidential military order is ill-advised because it is modeled exactly, almost word for word, on President Roosevelt's military order, presidential military order of 1942. Uh, in connection with the Nazi saboteurs commission case. Only problem with trying to replicate an order that's that old is the fact that the order in 1942 was based on the statutes of the 1920 Articles of War, which were subsequently replaced by the 1948 Articles of War, and then the 1950 Uniform Code of Military Justice, the 1968 Major Amendments, and the 1983, but the 1968 Amendments are the most significant in this connection, not to address 50 years of jurisprudential involvement and case law. It was a completely different system, and those people failed to recognize that and appreciate it. And, and they take the blame because they didn't really consult with military people and with uniformed attorneys who knew better. So that was a problem from the beginning. Uh, they, that, that order was published to great criticism and, uh, and they retreated to a certain extent and did maybe what they should have done in the first place with Fre Secretary Rumsfeld's orders of March of 2002, uh, which kind of fixed some of the problems that were obvious in the presidential military order, but it could never fix all of them because some of them are written in, in plain language in black and white. Uh, they did little things like ensuring that if there was going to be a capital case, it would take a unanimous verdict. The PMO on his face didn't require a unanimous verdict. It could, it, in theory, it could have been a two-thirds majority on a, in a capital case, and things like that. Uh, I came to this process a couple of years later uh, when I was asked if I would be the appointing authority. Um, I have admitted, divulged to many people that my sole reason for doing it uh, and, and now I'll say it probably publicly for the first time, my sole reason for accepting the position was because I was uh, concerned, not to say chagrined, at what was happening to military law and the way that military law was being misused and abused and, and quite frankly, not, not complied with. And so I thought, you know, I'm, I'm getting tired of what they're doing. Uh, they have the wrong idea of how military law works, of how military prosecutors function, certainly of how military defense lawyers function, and there was a certain cowboy attitude in some sectors of the government, uh, not all, not even most, but in some sectors of the government that this was gonna be easy and we just needed to have this system set up like it was in the good old days in the movies where you just automatically convicted people. And that mentality uh, is what led me to uh, assume the duties that I did. Um, I started in, um, as, as Scott said, in March of 2004, and uh, uh, the only uh, detail that I'd like to address is, please, anybody in here that, that, that is confusing military commissions, that is the trial of the detainees at Guantanamo, with combat status review tribunals, which is a completely different tribunal, which is the one that determines whether they're enemy combatants, please uh, disabuse yourself of that and realize we're only talking about the trials on the merits, the criminal trials. Uh, I was invited to speak at a law school, whose name I won't mention, by a professor uh, to talk about military commissions. And I finally realized just how confusing this is and how many people in the public don't understand the issues because they're just getting a broad brush treatment when the professor of law at this major university introduced me as a person who was in charge of the combat status review tribunals. <laughs> Uh, I just, I couldn't believe it, and I didn't, I didn't quite know what to do because I didn't want to embarrass him professionally, so I just kind of rolled with the punches and talked about what I do instead of talking about what I don't do. Um, at any rate, uh, we had, we had, we were, uh, under the old system, under the 2001 system, as, as bad and effective as it was, we had referred four cases to trial and had had hearings in August of 2004. This is lost on a lot of people. There were hearings going on in November scheduled for, uh, for all four of those trials when the Hamden decision of the Federal District Court came down and, and put a stay on, on that particular proceeding. Uh, on our own, we put a stay on the other three uh, to some criticism within the administration uh, and, and waited. And we started working then. Actually, we started working in October of 2004, a lot of people don't realize this, on an Article 135 Alpha, a modification of uh, the UCMJ 
that would account for military commissions and, and have a military commission statute, and on what we called at that time the Blue Book, a manual for military commissions. And we started working on that because we saw that, geez, if the Democrats win the election in November of 2004, they've said they're going to do something different. And we all know that staff work, if you do it for somebody, they'll accept it and they'll take it on as their own. And so we thought these guys, we're going we're to contact the people if they win the election and tell them, hey, you said you were going to change military commissions. Here's the answer. We got it all ready for you to go because we pretty sure they didn't have a thought as to how they were going to change it. They just knew that they wanted to say they were going to change it. So we were working on it even before the Hamdan decision. We were working on the possibility of trying to change the whole system. Thinking, thinking it might be the result of the election. And then after the election, uh, for a day, we were like, oh, this is not going to do any good. And then, then all at once we realized the president's talking more con in a more conciliatory manner because he, he won what was a close election. Uh, it looked bad a few weeks ago. He finally won. And we thought maybe, maybe we could persuade the administration to change this process, to change the military order, and to start using the manual for military commissions. Um, long story short, short we failed. Uh, and I'm talking numerous briefings uh, at the White House, in the Council's office, uh, in the National Security Council, uh, trying to make these changes all the way through August of 05, uh, failing miserably. Um, the only thing we got them persuaded to was that we ought to have a written prohibition against the use of evidence that was a product of torture. And, um, and maybe there'll be a question and I'll go on about that. Where I'm on time, I'm not paying any attention. Am I still okay? Um, I, Forgive me for not keeping track of this, but I'm, I'm determined to get out of here in 11 minutes because I don't want to be the guy to carry this over. And I know the questions are more important. Um, I'll, I'll use that as an example of, of how people can be misinformed. We were told we didn't need a provision uh, in our orders that prohibited the use of tortured evidence because the United States had signed up for the Convention Against Torture. So because we had signed up for the Convention Against Torture, we didn't need a specific prohibition. Um, my legal advisor at the time, General Tom Hemingway, had already gone on record and said he would never send the case to me if there was any evidence that was required to prove the, the guilt of the accused that had been the product of torture. So we weren't concerned as a practical matter with there ever being any evidence even attempted to be put in the court that was the product of torture. That wasn't the issue. The issue was, what do our rules say? And God knows we had enough problems with the rules as they were written, even though we thought we were going to implement them fairly. It took us six months, I think, to persuade people in the administration that our position internationally had been we are not going to pass a statute that implements the Convention Against Torture in this country because our Constitution prohibits anything that even goes closer than that. It goes close to that. The, the, the Bill of Rights and other provisions protect all Americans. We don't need any specific statute that implements the Convention Against Torture and prohibits any kind of evidence in a trial. We just don't need it because our, our own standards are higher. And we had to beat people over the head to make them realize, okay, that's cool, but you're saying the Constitution doesn't apply at Guantanamo and doesn't apply to these guys, so they're not protected by the Constitution. And we need to implement it with some type of regulation that prohibits the use of that kind of evidence. Finally, we persuaded them in August of 05, we got our little rule. We may not have needed it, but at least it it, uh, it, addressed, uh, it, it, it addressed an issue. But there, there were issues like that consistently in dealing with the administration and trying to get them to do right. Uh, the other big issue that, that we worked pretty hard was uh, the anomaly of, and this is what I said to the Deputy Secretary one time, you know, when I was trying to, and quite frankly, he came around on my side and, and uh, uh, our side, and uh, we still failed uh, to modify the, the presidential military order. But I said, you know, we're talking about the rule of law in third world countries and the importance of doing that on the one hand. And on the other hand, we have a rule in military commissions that says that if the members of the panel, if the, if the commission members don't agree with a ruling by the presiding officer, this is a trial judge, they don't agree with a ruling on the admission of evidence, they can overrule him. I said, what is the rule of law? If you boil it down, what is it other than when you don't like what the judge says, you accept it and drive on? You drive on to the appeal, and if you lose the appeal, you still accept it. I mean, that is the essence of the rule of law. I, I might say it's not much more than that, you know, it, when, when, you, when you play it out through all these countries. That's what it really boils down to. 
when a judge rules, you know, you don't kill them, uh, you don't ignore them, you comply. Whether you like it or not, that is the essence of the rule of law. And I said, here we've got our own little rule here that doesn't even comply with the rule of law. You're going to allow, let's say, five or six colonels or lieutenant colonels who are non-lawyers to overrule a judge with 10, 12, 15 years of experience as a judge in courts martial. And you're going to let them overrule his decision on whether the evidence should be admissible. Uh, in spite of that argument, and in spite of the Deputy Secretary at the time's uh, interest in that argument, uh, we, we failed even to get the presidential military order changed. And then, uh, quite frankly, uh, we got our lunch handed to us by the Supreme Court of the United States. And uh, here, here comes a piece that'll, that'll generate some Q&A. I think they're wrong. I think they interpreted the UCMJ wrong. I can't believe that they've got those high-powered uh, interns and, uh, and clerks, and they still could get that, the, the law that wrong, but they did. Uh, and they did it for good reasons. They did it because they're concerned about the international community's attitude toward the United States and the excesses of this administration and where they were going with the system that they were doing. Uh, and so, like a lot of decisions, it's, it's made for, for reasons other than complying with the law or even getting the law right. Uh, and we have what we have. And, uh, and that, of course, led to the, uh, to the Military Commission Act and, uh, and, and the ensuing changes to the system. I insist that had the administration made the changes that were recommended by many people in 2005, uh, they would have won the Hamdan decision in the Supreme Court. Is that provocative enough? Thank you. Uh, Major General Altenberg, that many of you may not know. When he was asked to take the position as the senior official for military commissions, he agreed on the condition that he could do it as a civilian in a civilian capacity. And as John told me, I hope he doesn't get offended if I repeat this. He said, so I could walk in to the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, and say, I hear what you're saying, but sir, I'm the one that makes the decision, and walk out. And I think that's a credit to John Altenberg. Well, well, General Altenberg's kind of shy and bashful about expressing his opinions, and uh, <laughs> it, it really is, it's a, it's a real pleasure for me to, to, to be here. As, uh, I know him as Colonel Silliman. I was a young captain when he was a colonel, and that's one of those habits you just never break. He'll always be Colonel Silliman to me. But as he mentioned, I was born in North Carolina, raised in North Carolina, went to undergraduate and law school in North Carolina. All my family's here. So even though over the last 24 years in the Air Force, I've spread branches to a lot of other places, my roots have always been right here in North Carolina. When I was growing up here, I was not, uh, my academic record was not uh, anything outstanding. So it came time to apply for law school. I'd applied to some schools in other places. And my mother uh, said, you know, why don't you apply to some North Carolina schools? You thought about Duke. And I said, look, Mom, I'd be better off just writing a $50 check to the General Scholarship Fund and not put the admissions officer through the hassle of having to read the application. So I'm not going to apply to Duke. I said, look, the only way I'll ever wind up in a classroom at Duke is if I will my body to medical science. <laughs> and maybe one day they'll wheel me in at the medical school as an exhibit. Well, on Wednesday this week, you know, I, was, I went by the office in the morning and I left early afternoon to drive down here. My mother called the office and the secretary answered the phone and my mother explained who she was and asked to speak to me. And the secretary said, ma'am, I'm sorry, uh, he's checked out and he's on his way down to Duke. <laughs> uh, now the cardiologist says she's gonna be fine. Uh, and, uh, and actually, I, you know, I really did, I, as uh, Colonel Sullivan mentioned, I went to law school at North Carolina Central and I actually did learn a Duke lesson without having to pay tuition or come to a Duke classroom. I came here in 1980. Uh, coach Koshevsky came here at the same time in 1980. I came here to go to law school at Central. He came here to coach basketball at Duke. But if you, if you follow the Duke basketball, you probably remember his second season here, 80, the 81-82 season, I think is the worst record Duke has had in modern memory. I think they won a total of about 10 games that year, four conference games, I think. It was February, I think, of 1982. And I lived in an apartment over on Maureen Road. And my wife, I'd said if I watched a basketball game that night, Duke had played. Back in the day, if you're from North Carolina, it used to be uh, Jefferson Pilot Broadcasting, carried all the ACC games, and Billy Packard was the announcer. Well, Duke had gotten handily beat that night, and I sat and watched the game. About 11 o'clock, it was a weeknight, getting ready to go to bed. 
for my wife work, they took turns, you know, baking things to bring in. It was her turn the next day. So as I'm getting ready for bed about 11, she went to the pantry to set out some muffin mix to fix the next morning and realized that we didn't have any muffin mix, which apparently was my fault. Because about 11 o'clock, I had to go to the Kroger up on Hillendale that was open 24 hours a day. So I get dressed. I'm not real happy about it. And I go up to Kroger, and it's about 11.30 by the time I get there, and I get the pack of muffin mix, and I go up, and that time of night, there's one lane open. There are a couple of people in line. There's a gentleman in front of me, and when we finally get up to pay, and he puts his items down, he turns around, it was Coach K. And they'd just gotten beat that night by probably 20 points, and he you know, kind of made eye contact, and I made eye contact, and I said, well, it's a tough game tonight, Coach. And he said, yeah, that it was. But he had a bottle of wine and a box of Tums. <laughs> Well, if you've been following the military commissions, I've been there for about 18 months, and I can tell you I've been drinking a lot of wine and uh, eating a lot of Tums for the last 18 months. <laughs> so I did learn a lesson. I know you said there aren't, aren't time for jokes. There's always time for a joke. There are three points I'd like to just kind of throw out. I, I agree. I think the most important part of this will be the questions that you have to uh, ask. Let me preface this by saying I'm, I'm speaking for myself. I certainly don't represent the administration or the Department of Defense. In fact, they'll probably be upset with some of the things I have to say. There are three points I'd like to, for you to think about, and General Altenberg touched on one, and that is the difference between the right to detain and the ability to prosecute. I think in the public's mind, those two have merged, and they're really two separate and distinct concepts. The second will be the, uh, our obligation to the individuals that we intend to prosecute. And third would be the public diplomacy, and I'll call them shortcomings. I was going to call them failures, but I'll just call them public diplomacy shortcomings that we've experienced in this process. Now, one of the speakers yesterday mentioned the uh, Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. And if you've studied that, if you've studied history, you know, prior to that, prior to 1648, if you were engaged in armed conflict and you were captured by the other side, usually one of two things happened to you. You were executed or you were enslaved. Now, the Treaty of Westphalia came up with this notion that we followed for the last several hundred years of detention and repatriation at the end of hostilities. And there's been this notion, you hear it all the time in the press and from some of the critics about, we have these people at Guantanamo Bay that we've been holding for four or five years, and they've never been charged, and they've never had their day in the courtroom. Under that concept of detention and repatriation, there is no obligation to charge anyone during the hostilities. In fact, in our own history, if you look back at Vietnam, uh, Colonel Floyd Thompson was held by the Vietnamese for in excess of nine years. He was never charged. He was never brought into a courtroom. But I think in the public's mind, they have this view that by detaining enemy combatants and keeping them off the battlefield, unless we charge them, charge them and bring them into court, we're doing something wrong, and we're not. Second would be our obligation to those that we intend to prosecute. There was a lot of talk earlier about the Constitution, I, and I think the question I asked probably expressed my view. I don't believe that, that the enemy, foreigners that, who want to destroy the Constitution, enjoy the benefits of constitutional protections. That's not to say they're not entitled to a full and fair trial, but I believe the source of that authority is common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions. Now, the critics will say if they don't get a trial that looks just like Martha Stewart's trial and ends up with an outcome like OJ's trial, it's not going to be a fair system. I'd contend that's wrong. Common Article Three, uh, in Part 1D, prohibits the passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without a previous judgment uh, pronounced by a regularly constituted court affording all the judicial guarantees which are recognized as indispensable by civilized people. I think if you look at the Military Commissions Act and the Manual for Military Commissions, we more than meet our obligation under Common Article Three. If you go out to the ICRC's website, and you click on, uh, take a look at Common Article 3, it also includes the commentary, what the drafters were thinking when they drafted Common Article 3. In their commentary, it says, we must be very clear about one point. It is only summary justice which is intended to be prohibited. No sort of immunity is given to anyone under this provision. There is nothing in it to prevent a person presumed to be guilty from being arrested and so placed in a position where he can do no further harm and it leaves intact the right of the state to prosecute, sentence, and punish according to law. As can be seen, Article Three does not prohibit an insurgent who falls into the hands of the opposing side from prosecution in accordance with the law, even if he has committed no crime except that of carrying arms and fighting loyally. So I would ask you to take, if you haven't done so, please go out to the, uh, out to the internet, take a look 
at the Manual for Military Commissions and the Military Commissions Act. I've stated a number of times, I would challenge it, and nobody's ever taken me up on it. Look at the rules for the International Criminal Court, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Khmer Rouge Court in Cambodia. Look at those internationally accepted rules for tribunals and compare them to the Military Commissions Act and the Manual for Military Commissions, and I think we come out far ahead as far as extending rights and protections. And finally, uh, and I gotta, you got to give credit where credit's due. I think our critics and our opponents have done a very effective job of using technology and using the media to present a false picture of Guantanamo Bay and of the military commission's process. And again, I think it's a public diplomacy failure on my part and on the government's part for having the view be so distorted. You know, Guantanamo Bay just has a naturally negative connotation when you utter that word. But those that have been there, uh, when, I, when I was going to school at Appalachian State, I was a bail bondsman. So I got to visit a lot of jails and a lot of prisons around the state. And I think a lot of the folks I saw here would trade places with folks at Guantanamo Bay, where it is a clean, safe, healthy uh, environment, where they're well fed, they're eating the same food the troops eat, they're getting the same, if I go to the clinic down there, those same doctors are seeing the folks at the camp. In fact, I usually have a slideshow, I'll put up a picture of a cell and I'll ask folks in the audience, what's inhumane about this cell? And folks will say, well, it's kind of small and it's only got a little window in it and you know, it just doesn't look right. And then I'll put up a picture of another cell and say, okay, what's wrong with this one? And they say, well, it looks just like the first one. And then I put them up side by side. And I tell them that first cell is where Congressman Bill Jankelo served his sentence in North Dakota. The second one is exactly like it's at Guantanamo Bay. So in my view, if it's good enough for a congressman, it ought to be good enough for an alleged terrorist. You know, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, I think there's been a false picture portrayed of Guantanamo Bay. I have nothing, I don't lose any sleep at night and I have nothing to be ashamed of about what we're doing there. As I said, our obligation is to provide a full, fair trial. And whether they want it or not, that's what they're gonna get. I'll give you one example. Today there's an article, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Swift was the counsel for Hamden, you know, the Supreme Court decision. There's an article came out in the press today about an interview or a, a a speech he gave at Emory University on Monday. And according to the, the article, you know, he portrays his picture of Salim Hamdan. If you ever saw Driving Miss Daisy, he portrays Hamdan as kind of like this poor driver, kind of the Morgan Freeman character. You know, that Osama bin Laden just says, hey, Salim, bring the car around. We're going down to the Dairy Queen for a dilly bar. <laughs> he talks about, well, you know, he does admit in 1995 he drove him to two speeches. Well, in the affidavit he filed in federal court, it said he started working for Osama bin Laden in 1996. There's video you may have seen on CNN from 2000 where Osama bin Laden is giving a speech and the person standing to his side smiling is Mr. Hamdan. He also doesn't explain that when Mr. Hamdan was captured post 9-11 in Afghanistan, there were two surface air missiles in the back of his vehicle. Now, you only use a surface air missile for one thing, that's to shoot something out of the sky. And the only thing flying in Afghanistan at that time were geese and us. And I think you know what they were intended for. But as I said, I think the important part of this is gonna be your questions. So I think I've uh, used up my time and I'll be happy to answer anything that you'd like to ask. Let me start by noting that while I'm here proudly wearing a Marine Corps uniform, I'm speaking in my capacity as Chief Defense Counsel for Office of Military Commissions. Um, what I say may not reflect the policy of the Department of Defense or the administration, and given my job title, it probably won't. Um, Samuel Johnson described a second marriage as the triumph of hope over experience. The same thing can be said of the Military Commissions Act. The original Military Commission system was a failure. As General Altenberg discussed, it started on the 13th of November, 2001. And over the course of, between then and when the Supreme Court invalidated it in June of 2006, it spent tens of millions of dollars. It produced not a single conviction, indeed not even a single trial on the merits ever began. Ultimately, the Supreme Court declared it, and I quote, illegal. And as Professor Chesney noted this morning, the Hamdan opinion is generally understood as saying it was also violative of the Geneva Conventions. And the system caused incalculable damage to the United States' reputation abroad. So now that we have this new com military commission system, should we bet on hope or should we bet on experience? 
Well, Secretary Gates, when he was testifying at the House Appropriations Committee the other day, said something very interesting about trials in Guantanamo. And it's a bit of a lengthy quote, and I apologize for this, but I think it's important enough to read it. He said, because of the things that happened earlier at Guantanamo, there's a taint about it. And it's one of the reasons why I recommended or pressed the issue of trying to get the trials moved to the United States. Because I felt that no matter how transparent, no matter how open the trials, if they took place at Guantanamo in the international community, they would lack credibility. Now, I think that's an interesting statement. Now, of course, the Secretary of Defense's statement was an empirical prediction, not a normative analysis. And it was a geographic statement, not a procedural assessment. But that being said, I think that Secretary Gates' testimony to the House Appropriations Committee invites the question, should the commission proceedings under the MCA be viewed as credible? And to answer that question, we need some standard for assessing the credibility, the legitimacy, the morality of a criminal justice system. And where do we get such a standard? Well, in my thinking about that, I thought of John Rawls' masterpiece, A Theory of Justice. Now, John Rawls is a philosopher, not a lawyer. And A Theory of Justice is about how we organize a society, not about procedural rules for a criminal justice system. But, but I still think that his idea here, his brilliant idea, is relevant to assessing the morality, the, the legitimacy, the credibility of a, of, a, of a criminal justice system. And Rawls's theory is that we would assume a free and reasonable group of people who were get, getting together to form a society. And they're all in their original position, pre-formation of society, and then here is, here is his genius, they're all wearing a veil of ignorance. And they're all told, maximize your self-interest in society. In other words, it's not a utilitarian maximize the benefit to, to, to the common society, but telling each person behind a veil of ignorance, maximize your self-interest. So no one knows what role they'll play in society. So to take an example, if you're told that you're going to be part of a society that has slavery, but you don't know whether you're going to be master or slave, would you say, would you pick such a system? And Rawls's answer obviously is no. If, if you, if, if, would you pick a society in which there was invidious discrimination based on immutable characteristics? If you didn't know whether you would have those immutable characteristics, once again, the answer would be no. So that's the way that Rawls treats that question. And, um, and I, I, I think that, that this is a useful way to think about the military commission system. If we were thinking about this system as a method of trying someone, and we didn't know whether our role in the original position would be the person being tried or the person conducting the trials, would we pick such a system? And I would go on to say that as the recent incident with the British sailors and Marines in Iran demonstrated, that hypothetical isn't so hypothetical, is it? You know, we all could find ourselves in a system like this in the role of the person being tried or the trier. So, so let's look at some of the aspects of the military commission system as we think about this analysis of, of us being in the original position in the state of veiled ignorance and whether we would select this particular system. In the military commission system, there is no confrontation right. There is no right to confront your accuser, which presents the possibility of being convicted and executed on the basis of nothing but hearsay statements with no ability to confront. And in practice, it's even worse, because many of those hearsay statements are obtained from someone that doesn't speak the same language as the person conducting the interview. So the investigator may be in Afghanistan speaking in English to someone who speaks, who speaks Farsi. The, uh, there's a translator who translates the question, and then the person gives an answer. The, the investigator doesn't understand the answer. The translator then translates the answer, and then the investigator probably not writing everything down at the time. At some later point, puts in notes of the interview, and those notes become evidence that could be used to convict or execute an individual. We all know the game of telephone. You know, what is the likelihood that that statement that's ultimately reduced to writing accurately reflects what that person said, if, if what that person said even accurately reflects the question that was asked in another language? Um, the Military Commissions Act expressly allows uh, the a military judge to allow consideration of evidence obtained by coercion. And this can be so, uh, evidence obtained by coercing a witness, or it can be evidence obtained by coercion of the accused himself. Um, in the normal court martial system, we don't allow uh, confessions that were obtained based on coercion. 
In the normal court martial system, we don't allow a confession to come in unless there is external evidence to corroborate that confession. In the military commission system, coerced confessions are allowable. In the military commission system, uncorroborated confessions can form the basis for a finding of guilty or being executed. Worse still, in the military commission system, an uncorroborated coerced confession can form the basis of evidence that will find someone guilty and ultimately lead to their execution. While the military commission system does have a protection, the MCA has a protection against evidence derived by torture, in reality, that is an illusory protection. When you say hearsay evidence is admissible and the burden is on the party opposing the hearsay evidence and sources and methods are not, are not susceptible to being discovered, then how would a statement that was obtained by torture, say waterboarding a particular individual to get a statement, how would the defense ever discern that that evidence was derived by, water, by waterboarding? So while there, while there is on the face a prohibition against torture, in reality, the other procedural defects of the system would, would they provide a means to launder evidence derived by torture. Um, and another, another uh, problem with the Military Commissions Act are the limitations on attorney rights. Uh, everyone must be represented by a military attorney and everyone must be represented by a U.S. citizen who is eligible to receive a security clearance. So, so put this into the context of if the Iranians had tried the British. Would we be comfortable saying, yes, that's a fair system of justice if those British sailors and Marines were required to be represented by a member of the Iranian military, and if those British sailors or Marines could be, uh, were, could be represented by a civilian, but only if it was an Iranian civilian to whom the Iranian government would give a security clearance. So if we put ourselves in that state of veiled ignorance, would we choose, would we choose such a system? And I think the MCA, to a large extent, answers that question. Because in the MCA, Congress peeked from behind the veil. And Congress said, this is a system of justice for aliens only. This is not a system of justice to which a US citizen can be, uh, under which a US citizen can be tried. So I think that's a very clear statement of what someone in a state of, uh, what a rational free actor in a state of veiled ignorance would select in this case. And it's also interesting to compare this system with some of the other systems that are available, um, with some of the other models that are available. If you look at the Geneva Convention, if you look at the Geneva Convention for POWs, the third Geneva Convention, there's a very interesting provision there. It's, it's Article 102. And Article 102 says you can't sentence a POW except under the same procedures that the holding power would use to sentence and punish its own service members. It's sort of a golden rule uh, article in there. But it also, that golden rule article would fit well within the Rawlsian analysis. Um, also think of our equal protection jurisprudence. Last night I reread the case of uh, Wong Wing um, versus the United States from 1896, in which the Supreme Court said we can't subject Chinese aliens to lesser forms of, of uh, criminal procedural protection than we would U.S. citizens case from 1896. Again, it would, it would come out well under a Rawlsian analysis. So I'll st simply stop by asking each of you to place yourself in the original position, place yourself in, in, under the veil of ignorance, and ask yourself, would I choose to have the military commission system be the governing criminal procedures if I didn't know what role I would play in the system? Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm deeply honored uh, to participate in this conference. I've heard a lot about it over the years, uh, never been able to attend, so I thank Professor Silliman for inviting me here today. And I'm personally gratified to be on the same panel with one of my mentors, John Altenberg. Uh, it's a real honor for me uh, to be here for that reason as well. Um, everybody's using disclaimers, uh, so I might as well tell you that what I say is, does not represent the views of Texas Tech University. <laughs> Although, quite frankly, I'm not sure that Texas Tech cares what I say here today. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Texas Tech is in Lubbock, which is in the lower panhandle uh, of, uh, of Texas, about 90 miles from uh, New Mexico. So it's far away from everything. Our next big city is Amarillo. So we're really isolated. Uh, my role here today, and I was a little bit puzzled uh, about why I'd been asked, because I'd never dealt with military commissions before. But I guess I'm the outsider, and I'm to give the macro uh, view of military commissions. 
Um, and in doing so, I just want to talk about a few macro issues, a few issues that have surfaced in the Military Commissions Act, especially with reference to the Restoring the Constitution Act, which is currently pending before Congress uh, this year, introduced by Senator Dodd in the Senate, uh, and I believe Congressman Nadler in the House. Um, and then just talk about why all this matters. Um, it's difficult to think uh, about military commissions in isolation, at least when you're an outsider and not tied to them as closely as General Altenberg and uh, Colonels uh, uh, Sullivan and Davis. Um, whenever you see a discussion or think about military commissions, it's usually in the context of a litany of other issues. Uh, the inapplicability of Geneva Conventions to members of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, uh, indefinite detention, extraordinary renditions, torture and coercion, Abu Ghraib, uh, secret CIA prisons, the denial of habeas corpus, and so on. And quite frankly, the nation's treatment of detainees has a lot to do with the fairness of the commission process. For example, had the nation treated the captured combatants as prisoners of war, at least until Article 5 tribunals were held to determine whether in fact they were entitled to that status, we wouldn't be facing these issues today. Because for prisoners of war, we would have had to use courts martial uh, to try them, as Colonel Sullivan indicated. We wouldn't have the problem with the admissibility of coerced confessions, because under Article 17, there's not much you can ask a POW. You can ask him for his name, rank, for us, social security number and date of birth, which ironically is pretty much uh, enough uh, to create identity fraud nowadays, but that's about as far as you could go. And finally, detainees would garner much less sympathy for indefinite detentions because the, indeterminate the indefiniteness of uh, detentions is the price you pay for going to war and getting captured. Alternatively, the nation could have treated terrorism as a law enforcement matter, in which case some captured uh, unlawful combatants would be subject to the civilian justice system together with all of its attendant protections, uh, including the right to a speedy trial and prohibitions against the use of illegally obtained evidence. But instead, this administration chose a third path, uh, one that was military in character uh, but not quite in accordance with the laws of war. And as Professor Mark Drumble put it, the administration categorized terrorist attacks as armed attacks instead of criminal attacks, but then cast important aspects of international humanitarian law, which customarily governs the conduct of belligerents and armed conflicts, as quaint and obsolete. Now, to an outsider, the promulgation and implementation of the rules for the military commissions has not been particularly smooth. The Military Commissions Act of 2006 is clearly a vast improvement of what had preceded it, but the nation has taken a seemingly inordinate uh, period of time to reach this point. And as General Altenberg pointed out, the initial problem with the uh, military order issued by President Bush is that it tracked a proclamation issued by Franklin Roosevelt back in 1942, which was based on the 1920 Articles of War. It thus set up a procedure that current military lawyers were completely unfamiliar with. Perhaps their grandparents might have been. And it's like, when you, when you look at the original uh, military commission process, it looks like a time war, like an episode of Star Trek, where someone from the 21st century is brought into and forced to adapt to the 23rd century. So rather than using the modern day court martial as the benchmark and building back from there, taking whatever exceptions needed to be taken for the war on terror, the administration was forced to use a high, to start with a highly antiquated system of justice and over time add the necessary bells and whistles uh, to commissions to give them the appearance of a modern court martial. Quite frankly, I agree with Professor Siegel that these people should have been tried by court-martial. We wouldn't have had the problems that we have today. And the question is, why didn't the administration treat these uh, detainees as prisoners of war, at least in the beginning? Why didn't it give them trial by court-martial? And I think in large part, uh, the question is answered by a, uh, I, I noted a speech by Joseph Margulis, who was lead counsel in the Rosul case, and it was sort of uh, reaffirmed or reconfirmed 
to some extent last by last night's speaker, uh, Mr. Powell, that the administration's concern wasn't really with justice or reacting to what had happened in the past, but rather was to prevent future 9-11s. And so, with all due respects to my colleagues on the panel, I believe that the military commission process was simply a sideshow, a coincidence, something that you had to do uh, to wrap up the loose ends. Um, the Military Commissions Act contains a lot of provisions, as I indicated, that are, are an improvement over the old system, but they still uh, uh, raise issues uh, that I hope we can address in the question and answer period, uh, because quite frankly, I don't have the answers, and I'm hoping the experts on the panel do. And picking from the uh, Commissions Act and trying to fit into 12 minutes what I'm going to talk about was pretty difficult. It's like picking from the luncheon buffet what you want to eat. You can't eat everything uh, in the time allotted. Um, at courts martial, and I want to talk up first about personal jurisdiction, whether someone is in fact an enemy combatant. And at court martial, that is the burden of the government to prove at the court as an interlocutory matter by a preponderance of the evidence. Under the Military Commissions Act, however, the commission is stripped of the authority to make that determination, at least as far as I can read it. Instead, the findings of the combat, combatant status review tribunals are conclusive. And the procedures before the CSRT are much looser than they are before military commissions. There is no right to a lawyer. Evidence even evidence that would not be admissible before military commissions is admissible before the CSRTs. And particularly problematic is the sweeping definition of enemy combatants. And according to Judge uh, Joyce Hens Green of the District Court for the District of Columbia, the definition could encompass a little old lady in Switzerland who writes checks to what she thinks is a charity that helps orphans in Afghanistan but what really is a front to finance al-Qaeda activists. Colonel Sullivan has also, also already mentioned the issue of coerced uh, 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 statements, and I hope we can get more into that in the question and answer period, but as uh, retired Colonel Dave Graham recently noted, Congress has for the first time in our nation's history legislated the use of coercive inter interrogation techniques to gain incriminating statements from detainees in U.S. custody. Incidentally, the Restoring the Constitution Act would in both instances repeal the provisions of the MCA. It would, it would uh, specifically provide or eliminate the provisions that make the CSRT determinations final and also eliminate the use of coerced uh, testimony. Third, I want to talk a little bit about criminal offenses. Uh, there's been a uh, recent uh, editorial written by professors Jeffrey Korn and Victor Hansen that noted that the MCA has jurisdiction uh, that extends to offenses that at the time the detainees acted were not war crimes. And one in particular is conspiracy, which at least the plurality of the Supreme Court believed was not a war crime. And there are others, such as offenses against the judicial process and hijacking. Well, inasmuch as the raison d'etre of military commissions, uh, in this instance, is a form for war crimes, uh, I think what needs to be answered is why do we have these other crimes included before the process? And finally, already mentioned, and I don't want to repeat what the last panel did, is the issue of habeas corpus. Again, it would not have been an issue had we treated detainees as POWs and work backwards with Article 5 tribunals rather than carte blanche deciding that they were not entitled to POW status. Well, the final question I want to address is why does all this matter? And I do not agree with critics of the administration that, assist, uh, that insist that the United States should scrupulously uh, abide by the laws of war because of what our enemies may do. And in this uh, instance, I disagree with Colonel Sullivan. Uh, about uh, the part I would want to play in, uh, I guess, Rawls dichotomy. Quite frankly, I'd rather be a detainee than be someone who is captured by one of our enemies. Because quite frankly, none of our enemies have abided by the laws of war for the past 65 years. You'd have to go back to the European theater to find any enemy that is somewhat abided by the laws of war. And even then, there were violations, such as the German massacre of American POWs at Malmedy. 
Reciprocity as a basis for following the laws of war is fine, but only if we're at war with countries like Belgium or Luxembourg. <laughs> Instead, the United States follows the laws of war, I believe, for a couple of reasons. One, because we're a nation of laws, and we do, and it's simply the right thing to do. And generally, at least as a JAG, I was always taught that we take the legal and moral high ground in combat. It's something that General Altenberg used to tell me and uh, the Judge Advocate General at the time, Walt Huffman, used to tell me the greatest thing about being a Judge Advocate is all you have to do is get up in the morning and do the right thing. I didn't find that to be true, incidentally, in private practice in Miami uh, where you had to bring a knife to the courtroom. Well, it's hard to do the right thing if the nation uh, is compromising its values by not scrupulously uh, uh, following the law of war. And second, as General Jack Rives, uh, Judge Advocate General of the Air Force, has noted, information concerning U.S. mistreatment of enemy combatants tends to become distorted and exaggerated in both the domestic and international media. By mistreating detainees, we divert attention from the actions of the enemy and we trigger a false moral equivalency between the United States and the people we're fighting. And in this regard, I want to make it clear that I do not believe that there is any moral equivalency between us and our enemies. They do not follow any of the laws of war. We're lucky to get our people back in one piece, let alone have them uh, 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 suffer through a military commission uh, and uh, ultimate detention. Morally, they are not worthy of the name soldiers. But that's all besides the point. We follow the law of war because it's the right thing to do. And by not doing so, we've diverted our attention and used valuable time and resources that we should have been using uh, in, uh, in winning the war. So I'll stop at that point and thank you very much. Allow me to uh, make just a couple of very brief observations and then we want to open it up for your questions. General Altenberg mentioned, and I think you clearly understood, that he was saying that in the creation of the Military Commission Act or Military Commission System by President Bush on the 13th of November of 2001, that those military practitioners in the law of war who could have been of great help in crafting the program were not included in the process. And that is unfortunate because of how it was built. Also, I think some of the judge advocates here with us today would also agree that for military lawyers, for them, it is the dual professions of arms and the law. Not one trumping the other, but both being equally important. That you wear the uniform of your country and you seek to do the will of the commander in chief, but nonetheless you are a lawyer and you will do everything you can while wearing the uniform to ensure that the rule of law is carried out. Now, regardless of how you individually view the Military Commission Act and the procedures for military commissions, whether you find fault in them or merit, I would tell you, as I've said so often, that I am sanguine. I am optimistic, not because of the system that Congress created, but because of the integrity and the honesty and the dedication of the advocates who you have before you. You see, these, particularly Colonel Mo Davis and Dwight Sullivan, are combatants in a trial. That is their role, to represent the interest to the best of their capacity of the detainees for Colonel Sullivan and the United States government for Colonel Mo. That's what Congress told them to do. But they are lawyers and they are military officers, and they will do that to the very best of their ability. And, and as I look at the system, and I, I've been involved with it for many, many years, and I also know these gentlemen very well, and my hope is that no matter how good or bad the system is, that these who are actually to practice it will make of it the best system they possibly can. And so I would tell you that I applaud these folks 
not for coming to this conference for us, but for the job that they do under extremely difficult situations. And with that, let me open up to your questions. Yeah, and we need to get, uh, yes, right there. Laura, we'll have you first. Um, thank you all for that panel. And I just kind of want to echo what Professor Silliman has just said. Um, you know, whatever sort of position you take about specific rules regarding the military commissions, I think what's really comes through is the profound commitment to the rule of law um, among those of you involved in the process and uh, within the JAG Corps, within the uniformed troops more broadly. And I guess my question is, it seems as if the some of the changes, the most troubling changes, have come from the civilian side. And, uh, and I'm wondering, is there a threat to that culture? Do you see a threat to that culture? Well, that's, a, that's an important question. I mean, I... Do you mean the military lawyer culture? Or do you mean the military itself? Or do you mean the government? What are you talking about? Well, let's about? start with the military lawyer culture. Um, and then expanding outward uh, to uniform troops. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, I don't think what's happened is a threat to military culture or to the military legal culture. Uh, that's been demonstrated that in spite of the uh, actions of certain members of the government, uh, a very small minority, by the way, uh, but disproportionately powerful and influential, uh, despite all that's gone on since November of uh, 2001, uh, the, repeatedly the military attorneys have stood up and resisted and been very forthright and candid. And, and we've seen two different regimes of judge advocate generals of the four services do that repeatedly. And we've seen, you know, different people hold different positions among, uh, in the military commissions and different people be the chiefs of criminal law of each of the services. And um, in, in the face of, uh, of uh, people in the executive branch that disagree, they have repeatedly asserted themselves and said what they wanted and said what they thought was right. And they've testified before Congress to that effect. So uh, I would tell you, that I, I believe that the military legal culture has been fortified and reinforced and strengthened by the travails of the last several years. Uh, and, and military lawyers are more proud than ever before of what they stand for, uh, the very values that Professor Rosen alluded to a little earlier. Can I answer that as well? Yeah. I can tell you, at least for us, the folks in my office, I don't think any of us, you know, this isn't about winning and losing. It's about a process that is fair and it's perceived as fair. I, mean, I think for us, we're more. Con it's not about bragging rights. It's about having a fair trial. You know, we, if you look back at Nuremberg, everybody kind of looks back that rom romantically now. But if you go back and look at some of the things Robert Jackson talked about, the ex post facto application of law and making up a new tribunal, a lot of the criticisms that we face today, he faced back then. What I'd like to see, I think everybody in my office wants to provide a fair trial that our grandkids will look back and be proud of what we did. You know, this isn't about winning. It's about having a fair trial for folks that are being detained. If I, sure. I want to make uh, one other point, and that is that um, there have been threats from the uh, civilian, the political uh, legal side, uh, to the independence of the JAG Corps. Um, it happened during the last Bush administration, uh, George H.W. Bush, um, uh, where the uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense, um, who's now Dick Cheney's Chief of Staff, uh, tried to pull the Judge Advocates General under the respective politically appointed uh, Service General Counsel, and uh, more recently, I think the Air Force has had some issues uh, with that. Um, in the first instance, uh, the, uh, the attempt was killed, I think, by uh, uh, congressional committees. This time, uh, it was uh, codified in statute, in large part led by uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who's uh, a reserve uh, uh, Air Force judge advocate. Um, and so uh, the, the independence of the, uh, of the JAG Corps uh, is now uh, something that uh, Congress has uh, preserved by statute. Yes, ma'am. Question down here, Bill. Thank you. To, 
follow up on the previous question. Um, the thought that occurred to me when Professor Silliman was talking, or the question that occurred to me was, um, you know, you're talking about how we can trust the integrity of the, the military justice system. It, to ask you whether you thought there was ever any danger that um, we might find the JAG Corps privatized and outsourced. And um, I just, semi-joking, um, what does the fact that when you join the military, you're not doing it to make money, um, and the military is not a profit-seeking organization. What difference does that make in the character of the people and in how they conduct themselves in the military? It makes a huge difference. I can tell you, I joined uh, right out of law school intending to do four years and get out. That was 24 years ago. And I stayed in because of the people. I mean, the folks, I mean, we'll fight tooth and nail and you think we hate each other, but then we'll go have a beer afterwards because it's the most ethical practice of law I've ever seen. So I have no desire to practice law when I get out. Uh, it's the people. And it, it gives you the ability. You'll have a young airman come in with a $50 problem that, you know, a, a lawyer downtown wouldn't touch and we'll spend four hours helping do the right thing over a $50 problem. So uh, I hope you're, you know, the outsourcing thing never happens. But I think it really is the integrity <coughs> professionalism I think is unmatched. You remember there was Congress that asked the military lawyers to be those who would advocate for the government and the defense and military commissions. If you go back to World War II, we've made several references to President Roosevelt's order in the German saboteur case. It was a Colonel Ken Royal, actually from North Carolina, who represented the German saboteurs and did a tremendously courageous act in going into federal court and challenging President Roosevelt as commander in chief. That's the model that you see now. Uh, it, it, all you have to do is read the papers and, and you'll see criticisms and comments and affirmances of either the trial counsels under Mo Davis or the defense lawyers under Dwight Sullivan. But these are professional lawyers who are wearing the uniform because they want to serve their country. I will guarantee you, you don't make a lot of money in the military. But why are they there? Because there is something about being in the service of the country and working as a servant of the sovereign that makes a difference. If I could point out one thing statutorily that, that glances on both of those issues that, that I think is interesting. There's a provision in the MCA that says military commissions and appeals and military commissions are not governed by military case law. They can consider military case law, they're not governed by military case law. But it's also interesting there's another provision in the MCA that says basically military courts and military appellate courts may not consider military commission procedures, which, which is interesting. It's, it's almost as if, as if they're acknowledging that this is um, an infection and we want to quarantine this infection. Uh, okay. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the front row. Nick, if you could bring that down to him. I just had a question to clarify. Uh, uh, Professor Rosen mentioned about the little old lady in Switzerland. Is can an American citizen be be brought before a commission? No. Absolutely not. Yeah, it, it, and the difference is when you look at the Military Commission Act, there are two definitions in that. One is the definition of an enemy combatant, and that definition does allow for an American under the Military Commission Act to be considered an enemy combatant. However, those who may be prosecuted by a military commission can only be alien enemy combatants. So an American citizen, now, and, and I don't know how the panel will agree with me or not, that's a political decision because when you go back to World War II, an individual by the name of Hoft claimed American citizenship and the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Stone basically said, uh, his American citizenship does not in any way shield him from the results of his belligerent acts. So in theory, under law, if Congress wanted to, an American citizen could be subjected, at least outside the country, and all sorts of constitutional issues there, but uh, this particular act that Congress passed precludes that by saying only an alien can be brought for a military commission. And, and that's what raises the equal protection issue that I mentioned. You know, is it constitutionally permissible to subject someone to a lesser form of procedural protection on the basis of alienage? 
And it, again, in our constitutional tradition from the late 1800s, we have the cases of Yick Wo v. Hopkins and Wong Wing that suggest the answer to that question is no. See, that's where we would disagree. I mean, I think they're entitled to what common Article Three says. And that's all the fundamental rights, the you know, presumption of innocent, right to counsel, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, the right to present evidence. Uh, if you don't. I think a lot of people that are concerned about some of what's going on are not. What happens to a foreign national, but mm -hmm. what could happen to an American citizen? What you're saying is it, it's not possible. They could not come before the. An American what? citizen may not be under the statute be brought before a military commission. Well, I think, you know, if I could look at it from Dwight's example from the book there, in my view, let's say, take the David Hicks case. Let's say that uh, David Hicks was an American and he was associated with the Bali bombing and the Australians picked him up and took him to Australia and subjected him to the exact same version of the Military Commissions Act that we have. I, you know, I certainly don't speak for the administration, but it, I personally would have no problem with that. You know, if, if we have one of our own citizens who becomes, you know, goes off and joins a terrorist organization, uh, you know, I, I don't see a problem with that. I think the rules are fair and it meets what common Article Three requires. Okay, can I follow up on that for just one second? I thought you might want. To. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this goes back to what Colonel Colonel Davis said about the, the duties to those prosecuted when he said the enemy who's trying to destroy the Constitution doesn't enjoy the benefit of the Constitution. Y you all know the. Um, the, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you, you know, th that it, I refer to this as the six degrees of the presumption of guilt. You know, whenever I hear someone defending the system, it, you know, within, within six moves, they're going to be down to they're all terrorists anyway or presuming their guilt. And, and, and I ask you to be aware of that form of argumentation when you listen to, to analyses in the Military Commission Act. Uh, gentlemen, you, you, are, you are not in trial now, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, in, in the back. A question. Yes, sir. Wait for the microphone, please. David? I'd like to uh, welcome you back to uh, law school with a hypothetical question. Uh, okay, so let's suppose we have uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq uh, a uh, uh, American soldiers capture a low-level enemy combatant. Uh, he's captured with uh, the following items. Uh, end caps for fluorescent light bulbs and light bulbs and uh, wiring, electrical wiring. Uh, motorcycle batteries and Timex watches, which, while they sound innocent, are also the wiring system for uh, an IED or launching a rocket. Uh, the evidence is then lost in transit uh, while he is being transferred to a large base, uh, and the team did not take any pictures of the evidence. Uh, when we just have the sworn statements of the capturing soldiers uh, and the summary of their chain of intelligence gather leading to the capture, how does this play out under the evidentiary rules, uh, taking into account best evidence rule and the unavailability of witnesses if those American soldiers should happen to be killed in action in the CSRT, uh, the military commissions, courts martial under UCMJ, and what do you think it should be? Um, okay, I think we're going to ask for an abbreviated uh, response to that, David. You know, I guess for me, I would prefer, you know, I know, like Dwight's example about the third hand hearsay statements you can't test and the guy could be sentenced to death and kind of like your example. I mean, is that possible? I mean, I think theoretically, is it possible? Yes. Of course, I don't know if you remember a couple of weeks ago, the Mega Million lottery was $370 million. I bought a ticket. So it was possible I was going to be filthy rich until they drew the numbers. I'd prefer to face realistic probabilities. And I've reviewed about 40 or 50 cases, and there's not a single case I've reviewed that matches Colonel Sullivan's example or your example. Take the Hicks case, for instance. That's the only one that's been done that was a guilty plea. There are photographs, letters home, statements to his father, statements from him, statements from other people. It's not this... Uh, this horror show that people try to sell to you. It's, I tell you, I think every trial is going to look uh, remarkably like any other, like take the Hicks case. You put him in a uniform, it looked just like a court-martial. Then why on earth are we not court-martialing these people? You know, why are we accepting the, the hit to ourselves to try people who could be tried by court-martial who, you know, and give them a lesser form of protection? I mean, I, I, I agree to a large extent with what Colonel Davis said. I think that with the old military commission system, with a couple of exceptions, and there were a couple of exceptions, but with a couple of exceptions, the issue wasn't so much what did this individual do? The issue was more what is the legal ramification of what this individual did? Assuming this person did X, is that a crime? Um, and we have established procedures to answer those, those questions. 
why don't we let those established procedures work rather than doing up a new system that is, that is not an, an accepted court? You know, let's let the normal courts martial work. That would be my answer. Another question. Uh, yes, ma'am, in the back. I'm glad you asked that question, the other gentleman, because that's kind of similar to what I was going to ask. Because when I talked to my husband's team members when he was, was killed, they told me that it was a motorcycle battery that they found. That, that was how they made the IED. Okay, so I, I've just come to learn a lot of things since then, like when I had to go to the hospital and they asked me if I wanted an autopsy done on my husband. I said, well, no, because I know how he died. I, I didn't want anybody touching his body after that. So, but they said, well, you might want to think about that man because it might be used, I guess, in a court of law or something like that. I can't remember the exact words. Um, but yeah, somehow if they had found the guys that killed him, that they would be implicated for murder, okay? And so later I got to thinking, okay, but what if, okay, because two other guys, two other soldiers died, and then what if they did catch those guys and they did take them back to Guantanamo Bay, and then what if they were released? Because I found out later that, yeah, they do release these detainees for whatever reason, I mean, I don't know, how do you know if they're guilty or not? And I just had all these questions, it's like, who decides and what are they gonna, what criteria? I know these are very non-technical type questions, but uh, like, how do you get the testimonies from the other soldiers, like the other guys that were on Chris's team? You know, there, there's a 10 or 11, 12 guys on a team, three died, okay, so who's gonna talk to the other team guys? I mean, are they going to get their testimony? Are they going to try to find out, hey, who do you think it was? You know, who were you all talking to in the village? Because they were very remote at the time. So how do you get a true sense of, even if they did find these killers that did it, how do you even know, oh, were they Pakistani? Were they Afghani? Were they Chechens? Were they foreign fighters? And then how are you, and then ha legally, it's like, are you going to try them under Pakistani law or Chechen law? Or do you see what I'm, right. I'm just confused. <coughs> no. I'm very confused. Well, remember, we are dealing in this panel with a Congress-created system. Congress created, whether you agree with it or not, Congress created a system of law for military commissions that these gentlemen have to follow. Uh, there, there was a lot of debate last summer uh, in the Congress regarding where you distinguish and where do you draw the line between using pure law of war theory and pure justice theory. And even, even the code of justice for the uniform person, our person, uniform code of military justice, is an admixture of law and discipline. It's not a pure justice system. It wasn't meant to be that. So what Congress tried to do was to strike the balance between dealing with folks who are presumably not entitled to full constitutional protection like someone tried in our criminal courts and yet still give a measure of due process that is mentioned <coughs> excuse me earlier because we are a nation under the rule of law congress may have done that they may not have done that we may have yet another constitutional challenge in the courts on the military commission act and as already mentioned we may have a congress revisiting that through senator dodd's bill but I think the point is that we all understand the system that Congress created. There is clarity in that statute, but there is also room for debate on hearsay, on confrontation that we've been hearing today. And those are on the margins of the bill that nonetheless Congress tried to strike the balance. And again, my point is that these gentlemen that sit before you will be the ones that will take that law that Congress passed and the manual that implements that law and do the best job they can in carrying out their respective duties. Dave, Dave Shanzer, over there on the left. Thank you all for being here for the uh, tremendous uh, presentations. Really appreciate it. I'd just like to maybe broaden the discussion and get your thoughts on something that I think about. I haven't decided how I feel about it, but uh, the question is, take for given for the moment that these folks, these detainees, do not have any right to Article Three, full civil liberties protections that American citizens do in a civilian court. But looking at our counterterrorism goals broadly, the goals being gather intel, detain people who are going to do bad things in the future, uh, but also to win a long-term ideological warfare that requires international cooperation, 
uh, and we're pr trying to promote democracy and the rule of law in places that uh, don't have that currently. So if you look at our counterterrorism goals very broadly, what would uh, serve those goals the best? Is it the military commission system? Would it be treating these people uh, in a military justice system, uh, but under the rules of the court-martial, just like uh, other uh, uh, soldiers would be? Or is it um, a, uh, a use a civilian uh, federal criminal system? And uh, I guess my, my, uh, on that one, what was wrong with the Musawi case? Anybody who wants to comment, appreciate it. I think the, the best thing we could do, and I know this is a point I, the administration and DOD disagrees, it would suit me if we did these trials on court TV. I, mean, I think we've you know, put this shroud of secrecy around them when everybody suspects something bad is going on. I think the trials are going to look, if you take the manual for military commissions and the manual for courts martial, there are a couple of differences, like the broader hearsay exception. But in all respects, it looks like a court-martial. And I think if we could let the world, like the Hicks case, we, there was no classified evidence involved in that case. I think we could have done it entirely open from start to finish. And most of the cases are that way. So I think letting people observe and see the process take place, I think, shows that we, we do adhere to the rule of law. The Hicks case was a fiasco. I, I don't know how many of you have read about it. The, the, civilian, the, the two civilians representing David Hicks were both kicked out of that courtroom. They were kicked out of the courtroom, on one of them on a clearly erroneous ruling from the military judge, the second one, oddly enough, on a clearly appropriate ruling from the military judge, but only because he had tried to usurp the authority of the Secretary of Defense. And let me get a little bit, a little bit into, what, into what happened, and I apologize, I'm a little worked up about this still, because the judge, because the judge did something that lawyers are not supposed to do, uh, and that judges aren't supposed to do, and that is he, he, he had an outcome-oriented decision, and he virtually said on the record it was an outcome-oriented decision. The, 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 the Military Commissions Act says you have a right to retain a civilian counsel um, at no expense to the government if he's a U.S. citizen and, and gets a security clearance. So there's a right to retain counsel. There's a provision in the, military, in, the, in the rules for military commissions, the implementing regs, the equivalent of the manual for courts martial for those of us uh, from a military justice background, where the Secretary of Defense said um, anyone representing in, any civilian counsel shall have signed the agreement promulgated by the Secretary of Defense. Okay, it clearly said that in order to be qualified to be a civilian counsel in a military commission, you have to have signed this form. By the time Hicks was tried, the form had not been promulgated. The Secretary of Defense had not promulgated the form. Therefore, it was clearly impossible for a military commission to move forward because the, the statutory rights of civilian counsel could not be vindicated in the state of the law that existed when Hicks was tried. Now, the military judge, in, in an ultra vires move, said, I'm going to institute that form. The same form SecDef said that he was going to promulgate. The judge said, I'll, I'll, I'll sign that form. The, the civilian counsel, and, and the, the form said, asked the civilian counsel to say he'd ob obey all military commission rules. The civilian counsel said, look, you don't have the power to do this, but I'll sign your form to make this move forward. If you add in the word in your own ultra vires form, if you add in the word existing, that I, I promise I'll obey all existing laws. But he said, look, you're asking me to buy a pig in a poke. I can't sign this statement saying I'll obey the rules when for all I know tomorrow there'll be a new rule. Be because we all knew when the Hicks was tried that there, there was this larger implementing reg coming down from SecDef that would include this form. Um, and he said, I don't know what's in there. So he could say tomorrow that I can't have a privileged conversation with my accused. But I'll sign off to say existing to make this case move forward. And the judge refused to do it. Now, the judge had no power to institute that form. It was, it was expressly prohibited to him. So why was this case moving forward when we all knew that the implementing regs were coming down, and, 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 but they weren't ready yet? Why was this case moving forward? Well, the, sec the, the Prime Minister of Australia gave us the answer to that. Prime Minister Howard said, and I'm directly quoting the Prime Minister of Australia, um, when, when he claimed credit for the trial date being set in the, in the Hicks case. It does mean that they're serious about getting on with it. I do think this is a result of the representations I've made to both the President and the Vice President. So this was a political act, the, the Australian Prime Minister. Now, it's also interesting, if you look at 10 U.S.C. Section 949b2, part of the Military Commissions Act, it makes it illegal for any person, not any person subject to the code, any person to try to influence the actions of, among other th uh, people, a convening authority. So we have Prime Minister of Australia admitting that he did something that under U.S. code is illegal, and we have him claiming credit for this, for this system moving forward when the system wasn't ready to move forward. Uh, so it, 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 was, it was just, it, it was a political act 
and, and it's not something that we would be proud of if we saw it on television. Do, do I, are you, are I you make one comment to that, because <laughs> I think I just want to know whether Prime Minister Howard is going to be your next client, that's all. <laughs> just one, one comment. The, the civilian attorney is talking about, you know, in the courtroom, went through this very dramatic, you know, impassioned speech and packed his stuff up and stomped out. What he didn't tell the judge was two hours before walking into court, he'd signed a plea bargain that had, had resolved the case. Uh, he knew at that time that the jury members were being assembled and flown to Cuba and that you know, he, he couldn't commit to rules off in the future when the future was about two days off in that case. So there had been a signed plea agreement that resolved the case. So after that, at a press conference, one of the reporters from one of the major papers here in the country approached me out in the parking lot and said, let me, I think I know the answer to this. Let, let me make sure I got it straight. All that happened in court on Monday was just a theatrical grandstanding show for our benefit. And I said, I think you got it about right. Can I ask okay. a question of the, uh, of the panel? Wait, wait a minute, you are the yeah. panel. Well, <laughs> not on this part. Did uh, Howard, I, I'm just curious if Howard's action was uh, any way related to uh, what the uh, Defense Council was doing over in Australia. I've just gotten bits and pieces. Right. We don't get a lot in the Lubbock newspaper, especially from <laughs> Australia. And if it doesn't deal with Bobby Knight, you usually don't get anything. But. What is, was there any connection between uh, Howard's uh, statement and, I, what was it, uh, Maury? Major Maury. Uh, Major Maury. Well, I think that Major Maury did a fantastic job as, as, uh, as uh, David Hicks's lawyer. You know, he's dealing, we're dealing in a situation where the President of the United States has said about the people in Guantanamo, they're all killers. We're dealing with a situation where they have been branded by the President of the United States, the Vice President, the Secretary of Defense, the worst of the worst. Now, David Hicks never killed anyone. In fact, there was an attempted murder charge that went to the convening authority, to Ms. Crawford. She wouldn't refer it to a court-martial because she said there was never any evidence that he attempted to murder anyone. So you, you have this, all of this publicity about the individuals in Guantanamo, that about David Hicks you know, and many others at Guantanamo was just untrue. And so, so Dan Morey went to Australia, and part of what he did as David Hicks's defense counsel was to attempt to correct the public record and give a, uh, a, a different view of who David Hicks was. And so, you know, did, did that have an impact on, on what happened? You, you know, I, 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 suspect that, I suspect that it did. But, uh, but I also view that as part of, uh, as part of uh, Major Morey zealously carrying out his duties to represent his client, which he did, he did successfully and fabulously. Mo, I'm, I'm going to give you rebuttal, and then I'm going to be the judge and cut you both off. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Those of you in uniform are familiar with Article 88. It says that you, a person in uniform can't, a military officer cannot use contemptuous language against the President, the Secretary of Defense, the Vice President, and Congress. So I'd made some remarks about Major Morey going to Australia in uniform and at demonstrations and protests and saying that the President cooked up a rigged system to cover up his own misconduct. So now if you go out and Google my name, uh, the number one pop-up on the blog sites is a 55-count uh, war crime indictment that says I ought to be put to death for criticizing Major Morey. <laughs> uh, I, some of you in the room may know that the argument that you just heard was played out very loudly in the press. <laughs> and I was trying as hard as I could, Rick, to stay away from it. But uh, anyway. Let me, I'm going to take the liberty of closing us out. It, it, it's 4 o'clock, and I don't want to hold you, but I, I want to go back and just say one thing to you. What, what, what you heard in, in the last half hour or so proves my point. These gentlemen represent their respective clients, and they will argue to the best of their ability. But I'll also tell you that they know each other. They are close personal officers and friends and they are merely doing the job that they have been appointed to do. And, and again, I would prefer to have someone like that representing me, whether I be the government or the defense, in any kind of a system that Congress created, rather than someone who would merely fall and say, whatever my client wants me to do, I'll do. So I, I think we should all be proud of the caliber of the individual whether they be prosecutor or defense, that is making this system as good as it possibly can be, whether you agree, and, and I know personally that they both have issues with the act on both sides of the other, but they are doing what they have been asked to do, and they are doing it with the best dedication they can. So will you join me in thanking this panel?
And I'm going to go ahead and, and close this out. I very much appreciate your coming to the entire conference. Uh, we hope it has been of value to you. If you have not filled out an evaluation form for, for me to look at and hopefully make this better uh, next year when we convene on hopefully yet another topical issue, uh, whether we've invaded Iran or whatever, I don't know what we're going to do. But anyway, we will be uh, hosting another conference like this, and we want to make it better. So we, have, we appreciate your coming. Uh, we appreciate your thoughts, and we hope you have a safe travel home. Thank you.